up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. I've got a brother on that's been in the penitentiary straight out of Baltimore. I don't know if he's a Ravens fan. Probably I've seen a tattoo on his arm. I'm just saying. But anyway, he can tell his story better than I can. You know, I always say that, but this brother's been through it, seen it, lived it. Big Sandy. You know, we always talk about Big Sandy. But anyway, Eric, tell the people who you are, where you're from. And let's get into your story. Hey, what's up, Chad? Hey, what's up, uh, guys? Uh, my name is Eric Foss. I'm from Baltimore City. I'm from Northeast Baltimore City or East Baltimore. Um, I've uh, I came. I grew up in Baltimore City. I came up uh, basically. You know, uh, my I met my father when he escaped from prison. I was about nine years old. So my father, uh, first time I met him, you know, he took me, got me high on some weed. You know, so, you know, just like. Typical like that. My grandparents, uh, my father wound up going back to prison. My grandparents actually raised me and, um, you know, started off young. Like we didn't have no money or anything like that. So start off hustling young, not hustling drugs or anything like that. Just like, you know, even me and a couple of friends, we might go in the store in the morning, steal a bunch of candy, whatever, sell it in school, you know, then baseball cards, then, you know, certain things progress and then um, get into drugs you know, I got into drugs probably when I was about 13 or 14, got into selling um, coke. And basically what we would do was, you know, it was a, it was like a little crew of us. So back then, you know, people call it crack nowadays and all they had like ready rock. That's what we call it. So we would we would get a, you know, half break, whatever, break it down into dimes and um, have it down on Baltimore Street. It was like the Baltimore block. It was called. It was like a bunch of strip clubs, everything like that. So we started getting a decent amount of money for young for young guys. So with that, you know, with that came the uh, whole Baltimore Street wound up getting indicted. So when Baltimore Street got indicted, we were too young to go in the indictment because it was a federal indictment. Well, all of a sudden, the whole indictment went went away because the police were really smoking crack. They were really having sex with the girls, stuff like that. So as things progressed. Around like 1996, I had to get out of town. So I had, a, you know, I was getting accused of some bullshit, you know, just some drug related stuff. So I left town for a while. I was in South Florida. So when I come back from South Florida, it was a couple years later. I come back. I come back around the way. You know, I had a little plug up in New York. So I started getting a lot of money back around the way. All right. Next thing you know, I have these bars that are like pumping. Like bars were the new strips, like how it used to be like crack strips, dope strips and all. Bars was a different level of money. You're not dealing with the you're not dealing with the crackheads and none of that kind of stuff. You're dealing with the guy who worked all week. Now he's trying to spend his check. So we got these bars jammed and each bar is probably doing like 60,000 from like Thursday to Saturday. So everything's going good. Everything's going great. Now I'm a young guy. So the reason why the narcotics the actual state narcotics, district narcotics got on me was because what they did was my name was ringing. And there was this one night we were all outside. We were all hanging outside this bar. The bars were closed and everything, but we had liquor, you know, everything like that. It's like me and probably three or four of my homeboys. There was a couple of chicks there and all. And it was just like, um, we're all just hanging outside this guy, crackhead Timmy's house drinking. You know how it is like when you're younger, you know, it's the summertime, you know, cars pulling over, people getting out, chilling for a few minutes, shit like that. Well, anyway, this neon pulls up. So it's this white neon, and this dude gets out of it, and he starts walking Not down. Not the Dodge neon that everybody had that was like 10 grand brand new off the lot, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's the exact one. So look, this guy gets out. He comes walking down, and he's talking with like a New York accent. And he's a fat black dude, and he's like, uh, yeah, what's up, B? What's up, B? What's, where's the white boy E? Where's white boy Eric? So I'm like, who the fuck is this guy, right? So now the neon had pulled off. So I was like, hey, I'm Eric. Wow, what's up? He's like, he's telling me, like, he's trying to cop off me, like, by, like, a quarter ounce or something like that. And I'm, I look at him. I'm like, look, bro, I said, I don't even do that. And honestly, that night, I didn't even have nothing. It was just, like, one of the chill nights. So he kept pestering me. So I nod to my homeboy just for my homeboy to just bang him, right? Well, my homeboy goes to swing on him. Dude ducks, weaves my way. I hit him. Dude falls down. And we hop on him. We're on him like like flies on shit. And now, like, my homeboys, they were the type of dudes that, like, uh, 
they were big dudes. They were all over six foot, 250, wear a size 14 boot. And they were the type, they would wear like the fucking camouflage and, and you know what I mean? Like the camouflage and the big butter Tims in the summertime and shit. They're, they're like that. So we're, we're stomping this dude out or whatever. So a MTA bus comes like driving down. Cause this is on a main road. This is in the city on a main road. So the bus driver, he's like on a microphone thing. So I look down and see the guy all fucked up. I'm like, cool. We got to get out of here. So we all get, get up out of there. So anyway, we get to this place we call the Bat Cave. That's like 15 minutes from everywhere. So I page my brother. This is back in the days of pagers. So I page my younger brother. He was alive at the time. I told him, I said, hey, I said, when he, when he, uh, when he called back, I said, hey, go up to Crackhead Timmy's house. Let me know what's going on. So he walks up there. The call, well, when he pages me back or whatever, 20 minutes later or whatever, my brother, he didn't really don't know what's going on, but he scared the shit out of me. He's like, man, Eric, he's like, I don't know what happened up here, but apparently there's a cop that got killed. I was like, holy shit, right? So, you know, I got a couple of dollars, you know what I mean? But now it's all of us have to go on a run. I'm assuming if this really happened, you know what I mean? So I'm like, are you sure? I was like, well, where's crack at Timmy? He's like, they're all down the police station. So I'm like, fuck, right? So I said, well, when you see crack at Timmy, have him page me. So I remember the payphone number to this day. You know what I mean? You know how back in the day when it was when pages, you still remember the payphone numbers around the way. So he, I get the page from Crackhead Timmy. So I, 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 I was, I call him. And I say, hey, what's going on? I said, I heard a cop died. He's like, thank God. He's like, no, that's not what happened. I'm like, well, what happened? He's like, well, it wasn't a cop. It was an informant that they were trying to set up to make a controlled buy or whatever. And the cops had dropped him off and pulled off. And then the incident happened. Well, while the guy was on the ground, they were asking him. They were trying to ask his name, like the ambulance lady and stuff. He couldn't say his name. So the lady pointed out. So that's why he can't talk, because his tongue was on the side of the road. Like, I guess his, his tongue got kicked out of his mouth, like half his tongue or something like that. So anyway, that's still a bad situation. You know what I mean? It's not as bad as it being a real cop or nothing like that. So. We, we lay low for a couple months. Now, when I come back around the way, you know, as a little bit of time go, goes by, I get raided. Okay. They raid me on a drug raid. So as the cop is bringing me out in the hallway, the narcotic, this was just Northeast district narcotics. Okay. This is just like back in the day when they had each in the city, each district had a narcotic squad. This was Northeast district. So the main cop or whatever, he walks me out in the hallway of my apartment while the raid's going on. So I'm like, what the hell is this about? So he's like, look down there. And I look through like the glass, like where the apartment's got the glass. Guess what I see? The white fucking neon, right? I almost faint. He's like, yeah, that's my neon. So he sees like, I'm like, I'm deflated. So he goes like this. He's like, look, you punk. He's like, you don't got to worry about it. We can't, we're not charging you. We can't charge. We could get sued over that. Sh-. You know what I mean? Because they basically left him out, out to dry. But then he tells me, he's like, he's like, oh, but let me tell you something. If I ever catch you by yourself, he's like, I'm going to blow your effing head off. So I'm like, all right, well, if I ever catch you by yourself, I'm going to blow your effing head off. Dude, so this started like, this started like a, a, a real beef. Like anywhere I went, anywhere I stayed, anything like that, people would get harassed, get raided. I remember, look, it's such a sad situation that. I, they tried to revoke my bail because I got out on bail. So the narcotics squad was trying to revoke my bail. So I had to go for a hearing. So when I went for the hearing, they actually made a fake indictment. I found out that it was fake. Anyway, my baby's, uh, my baby's mother was about seven months pregnant, six months pregnant at the time. Right. And while this hearing's going on with me, they actually announced that they're putting an indictment on my baby's mother. Right. So I flip out. I flip out right there in court. I turned around, called him a bitch or something. Next thing you know, he said something back. So we start basically almost fighting in the middle of the court. The judge is beating the gavel and everything like that. Because I'm so heated over what they just what they just pulled. But at the end of the day, I'm the idiot because it, it was a fake indictment. It was never real. My baby's mother was actually working with the police. I, you know what I mean? And I'm sitting here about to fist fight in court. You know what I mean? So basically, that's how that that they really got on me heavy. So they wound up, they wound up uh, putting me away that time. I went to state prison. I went for six years. Okay. I got six years sentence. I wound up doing four on that. But how old were you when you went to state prison in Maryland? I was, I was, I was 22. 
I was 22. Let me ask you what it's like in the street. I mean, you're white, right? Yeah. All right, so what's it like for a white dude growing up in Baltimore out there getting money? What I mean, are the, are the dudes out there letting you get money? No, <laughs> no, not at all. You know what I mean? No, not at all. We've been, uh, you know what I mean? I've been in, uh, I've been in like some shit, you know what I mean? But this is back, you know, I'm close to 50 years old. This is back in the day, like, <clears throat> you know, there's been like, even in that same area I'm talking about and around that same time, we had like a little, little war going on, stuff like that. Because, you know, there is people, especially back then, there is people that will say, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, you know, white boy soft, you know what I mean? Whatever, or think that or whatever. And, you know, people will try. But that's actually the dumb people, honestly, because it actually works another type of way. Because I had dudes, listen, I had a lot of dudes that were like, they would beef over me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the bigger dudes. Because I was the white dude who could get into these bars. I could get into this different type of money and this Coke money. You know what I mean? They couldn't see that type of money. You know, so it, it like it like worked out. But yeah, but like now, like even like even like back in the day, bro, like even coming in into like getting locked up as a juvenile shit like that. Like, bro, you had to fight if you were white. Listen, if you were white, you had to fight. That That's that's it. it, it it's it's common sense. You know what I mean? It's, it wasn't people hugging you. It wasn't homies. It wasn't a gang. It wasn't on that back in juvenile. That's like, look, I'll tell you how I, I'll figure it a dude's got a little, at least a little bit of a fight game. Anybody who's been in juvenile, you know what I mean? Juvenile, especially white dudes, if they made it through juvenile, you know what I mean? And still, you know, you know, still a little bit, you know, got their head up. Hey, they probably got a little bit of a fight game, you know what I mean? Or at least they're going to stand up for themselves. Cause that, that bro, they had shit called LD liquid diet. Like if, uh, you get your lunch or whatever. This ain't even commissary. This is like the stuff issued to you. Somebody will come up and try to take it from you, you know what I mean? And just leave you the drink or whatever. So basically what you got to do is, because, you know, that's juvenile. It, does, it ain't like stand up for yourself. People who respect it or whatever. You just got to go, you know what I mean? So you basically knock the shit on the floor. So in case you lose, you know what I mean? Nobody's getting that motherfucker, you know what I mean? Nobody's getting it, you know? Well, it's, you know, so... Yeah, so all that kind of stuff, yeah, getting tried and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I've been through I've been through all that kind of stuff. You know? So you're in a state prison, right? Six years. What's state prison like in, in Maryland back then? Is there DMI back then or not really? No, I, I I I think it just started back then because that was the 90s. I think like the BGF had started like 95 or something like that. So there was that, but I didn't really consider that like a gang. Like I didn't know what DMI was. Now I know the people in there, like I know a lot of people in there, and I know a lot of people like were like higher up, all that kind of stuff. Like one of my homeboys got sent out of state. I know all that, but like I had never actually heard of them until I got in the feds. And it was it was because of a case manager that accused me of being in it. I didn't even know nothing. Like I never heard of it. You know what I mean? But I do now. You know what I mean? I do now. Like I hear of it now. But like that wasn't like when I grew up, bro, that, that was uh I'm I can't speak for these younger guys, but because they might be born into something different. But when I grew up, man, look, I'm close to 50 years old. When I grew up, it was neighborhoods, bro. It was neighborhoods. You know what I mean? We didn't have gangs, none of that stuff. Us too. It was, you know, we had our little crew down on our block. And down the down the way, they had their crew. And we had some violent incidents when we were kids, man, where we were beefing. And we got busy. Yeah. And they got busy. It was, it was really your neighborhood. You know, you, you do this state time. You get out of prison. What's life like when you walk out of the state? Because we're going to get to the feds in a minute and, We'll probably get, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the Aryan Brotherhood. I know you were there when some serious shit happened on, you know, the Super Bowl or whatever. We'll get into that, though. Um, So you get out of prison. What's life like walking out? Well, it wasn't, look, it wasn't that bad. Like, I still had some dough. You know what I mean? So I came home. I came home to a couple dollars. And this is how I didn't last long at home. I only lasted eight months before the feds got me. So basically, I come home. I still got money. Now, here's what happens. I'm not even hustling at the time, but I opened a carpet cleaning business. I bought this Acura RL. Like the first day I got out, I walked up, bought it for like 20000 at um at a neighborhood car dealership. I totaled it that night, leaving the club. And then I copped the Escalade a week later. You know, so it was just like people might have thought I was doing something at the time. And actually the feds, the feds wound up thinking that. What happened was I had a buddy I used to hang out with. And he's still a friend to this day. Don't, don't get me wrong. Well, anyway... He's hustling or whatever, smaller shit. He probably gets like four and a half shit like that. Well, there was a kid who got arrested. Now, for anybody listening to this, pay attention to how this shit can work, to how it can go from petty to very serious very fast. 
on something petty. So he's meeting he's meeting this kid that actually got busted. He don't know the kid got busted, but the kid's like an informant now and going to set him up for a control buy for like a quarter ounce. OK, so, you know, that was like a little state crime or whatever. Boom, boom. Well, as the kid comes to meet my buddy at the strip club, he brings the guy with him who's buying it, which is a cop. My buddy don't know it's a cop. You know, it's an under, he, you know, this is an undercover thing or whatever. Well, here's what happens. The informant winds up going to take a piss. My buddy is sitting there with the cop, tries to steal the informant's customer, not knowing what's going on, hands him his number, says, hey, if you want to get better prices, more shit, shit like that, just come directly through me. So the cop, he just hit the, hit the lotto, right? <laughs> so what happens is my buddy, we had another friend that was also, he had my first name, Eric. So my buddy was dealing with him. Now, I'm not saying I was innocent on this because I wound up getting involved. But look, this is how crazy it is. Even if I wouldn't have got involved, the feds would have invited me. So his name's Eric. Now, my name's Eric. Now, I'd be pulling up to my friend's house, the one who did the, the thing with the police, not knowing. I'd be pulling up, picking them up. You know what I mean? We're going out. We're going out with different chicks, stuff like that. So one time, I guess the cop calls him, and it's really not me, but the cop wants uh and this is another thing you should pay attention to. The guy's buying quarter ounces. Then a week later, he's buying eighth of keys and, and, and 100 e-pills. You know what I mean? So anyway, so that's something like that he wanted. So my buddy said, yeah, well, I got to get in touch with Eric. So they start surveillance. And obviously, they've been surveillance them. They see my Escalade pulling up. I'm out. I've only been out of uh, prison a month or two. I'm in a bunch of jewelry, Escalade, everything. Guess who Eric is? You know what I mean? And... um. And then I wound up, you know, I was blowing all my money. I'm not going to lie, because, you know, I just got out. I've been locked up. I'm still young. So I was flexing a little too hard. So I had to make some more, you know, I had to start making money. So I go grab like a joint or whatever, go, go grab like a bird. So I got back into it. And it did wind up becoming a wiretap. So this shit, when they indicted us, they indicted us for all together. It was, it was Dominicans, in, 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 Dominicans up in New York. Um my buddy Bobby, me, John, a couple other people. I mean, it was just crazy. Like, you don't even know. Like, you get indicted. You Basically, I only knew, like, two people on it. I mean, I knew of some people and stuff like that. But um, they wind up, you know, it was a federal case. So I wound up getting, um, I got 12 years. I got 145 months. I got 145 months because back then they charged me. Like, remember back then they were just charged in a drug conspiracy you probably remember, Chad. They would just charge the whole drug amount, and everybody's basically responsible for it. You know what I mean? But I'm actually, I'm actually one, the one who actually has, you know, what I mean, I beat it. I, I don't even want to say beat it, but I, I only got convicted of a brick and a half, you know, because I wasn't, I wasn't guilty of 150 bricks, 50 bricks, or whatever. So we found a, um, we found a case. I actually found a case, 1993, United States versus Urban, which is a Fourth Circuit case, which is where I'm at, the Fourth Circuit, that says you're only responsible for what you. Uh, part token or whatever. So I wound up going to get convicted of um, a brick and a half of powder. And then I got the 145 months. And then that's when I went to the feds. And Stop you for a minute. The sentencing commission today just passed this thing on acquitted conduct. Like, you know, you go to trial and, you know, you get found guilty of a key and then they want to sentence you for 50 keys. The sentencing commission just changed that today and said, you can't do that stuff no more. Kind of similar to what you're talking about. So it's probably going to save a lot of dudes, man, a lot of people you know, fixing that acquitted conduct. As long as it's passed by the sentencing commission has to be authorized by Congress. But, you know, people don't know that are watching the show that you might get caught with 500 grams and, you know, you think you're good. It ain't too bad when you look at the chart, right? I mean, anytime in prison is bad, but next thing you know, you go to get sentenced. They're like, oh yeah, but you sold probably about 10 kilos. And now they sentence you to 10 kilos and now you got a 30 year sentence instead of a seven year sentence. So anyway, I, I interrupted you. I apologize. Go ahead. Oh yeah, so no, nah, I was going to, I was going to even say though, but like for like the audience, like even when they do pass these laws that help, Chad, you notice yourself, them fucking prosecutors are thinking of another law just to dump on top of it to make up for it. <laughs> you know, it's like that. That all the, it happens like that all the time. So look, you're only out a little bit. You just did it, you know, a little, a little more than a nickel in the state. You get this 144 months in the feds. What's it like for you at that moment in your life? What are you thinking? Like, damn, man, all this time. Yeah, it was like, it, yeah, it was, it was like kind of like a shock, you know what I mean? So, because like, I didn't know, I didn't know nothing about the feds. I thought the feds was just like El Chapo type deals, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. I didn't know how it was. 
and federal prison was was totally different. Like federal prisons totally different from state prison. Like um, I started an FCI. I started at Gilmer, FCI Gilmer. So when I got there, Gilmer was wide open. Like it was, I mean, dude, it was a, it was wide open. So much money, gambling, drugs, liquor, stuff like that. You had um, it was, even though it was FCI, you had a little bit of the the politickers, you know what I mean? You get them corny ass white dudes together that are just like, you know what I mean? They'll try to politic on people and do this. Then all come all comes out at the end of the day, they were rats the whole time. You know what I mean? All that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, so when I went there, it was like kind of like it was a little bit of a culture shock, but see, like I started the FCI. So I was like, um, I wound up getting thrown out of there. So I get thrown out of Gilmer because um I had a ticket, like, you know, like, you know, uh, sports bet, you know, for the audience, sports bet and all that kind of stuff. I had like a really big ticket on the yard. So I was doing pretty good. Plus, you know, I was getting money. You know, I, I knew some people getting some things in, stuff like that. So, you know, we were getting money stuff. So you were the ticket man up, all the time. You were the ticket man also. Yeah. Yeah. I was the ticket man. Yeah. So um, let me say this. A lot of people don't know what the ticket man is. It's a gambling ticket, like a parlay. And the ticket man usually has some bread or else he can't start a ticket. And it's one of the best and most lucrative hustles in prison, right? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it could be lucrative. You get your head busted, too, though. I'm not going to lie. You no, know, one, look. Hey, I had a $1 ticket when I was in USP Lee, right? And the dude, you know what? I'll tell this story a se- a, in a separate video. But they came to me like, yo, I put the odds at 20 to 1 on, on a four pick, right? And they had them at like 11 to 12. They went to 13. I went to 14. They went to 15, I went to 18, and then they wanted to have a meeting. Like, yo, bro, you're messing the whole compound up with this. I said, bro, I'm just trying to get one dollar. It's a one dollar ticket, man. But anyway, the ticket man usually got a couple dollars, but go ahead. Yeah, so like, so like the whole time at Gilmore was like basically it was like a party. Like you would see incidents happen. There was just like, but it's more like in the FCI, you you can get fist fights and stuff like that. It's not all the it's not all the stabbing. There is some stabbings and stuff, but like it's not, it's not like the penitentiary. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, so everything was good there, but like, I was all right on that compound for, I was there f- over four years, but you know how like the administration starts getting tired of hearing your name, the SIS, things like that. It wasn't like the COs would harass me or whatever. It was just the administration. And there's so many people going and telling on you for different things. And, you know, it's just like, like people think people, man, these people are telling everything. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're not getting away with nothing. For, for any period of time. So what happens is we're, my my celly, he went to the shoe for a dirty yarn. Okay. So he had, he had done his time. He was getting out this day. So I got, I think I got five gallons of wine. Right. And I mean, it was gas. This wasn't, you know, it wasn't shine. It was wine, but like good wine. Cause they had like the oranges, the real sugar. You know what I mean? That kitchen had the real white sugar You're getting out by the bags. Like when I got to the penitentiary, the penitentiary was like, bro, they're stealing the sugar. You know, the, the pink packs and all that dude we were getting you know fci you know how it is you know i mean especially it was a new place you know it only opened in 03 so they didn't even know how to control everything yet so anyway so this was this shit was gas so we're sitting there i had a handicap cell so you remember how the handicap cells are bigger than the other cells so everybody's in there partying and i'm the type of person like you probably see i'm the type of person like i'm i'm cool with everybody like i don't do all the you know, I'm on man time, bro. If you're a man, you're a man. You know what I'm saying? I don't do all the race stuff. I don't do all this stuff. I don't do all that bullshit, you know? So everybody's in myself getting drunk. We're throwing a party for, for my cell. He got out of shoe. So there's this kid. He, like, walks around the unit, you know, and he's known as being a unit snitch or whatever. I think he worked in maintenance. He's one of them. You know what I mean? So he keeps looking in his cell. So I got I'm I'm lit. So I was like this. I said, um... I tell everybody, I say, he walks by this cell one more time, I'm snatching him in this motherfucker, right? So everybody's like, oh, shit. You know, nobody's nobody's trying to calm it down. We're all drinking, right? So anyway, here he comes walking back by. So I snatch him, boom. I grab him up in there, right? I said, you little bitch. I was like, I know you're telling him what you're going to tell him. He's like, yeah, I swear I'm not. I swear I'm not. I said, you know what? I said, D, that was my man from Detroit, Southwest Detroit, D. I said, D, fill him up a nice cup. So you got the coffee mug filled it up all the way to the top and this was some gas right i was like guzzle that shit <laughs> he fucking guzzled it so he sits in there for like five minutes and shit so he starts getting drunk he starts like talking like trying i was like get the fuck out of here you're out of here so okay so now 
what happens is I'm out of pocket this night. You can, you know what I mean? I'm totally out of pocket. So I'm on the tier. I was looking at my ticket uh, because I had just got hit recently for like, man, we got hit for like $7,000. And then this night, it was like um, a Monday night football game. And you know how you'll mix the football with the basketball or whatever and do halftime tickets and all that shit? I had one of them out. And everybody was, it was uh, Arizona against San Fran. Everybody took Kurt Warner, you know what I mean? So I'm like, I'm kind of sweating that while I'm drunk. Keep coming out, looking at the score, like, home, oh, and I don't get my head cracked. So the CO comes up to me. This was not the CO's fault. CO comes up to me and he's like, Foss, just go lock in yourself for the night. There was only like probably like a half an hour left till we lock in anyway. I'm like, all right. So I walk there. I stay in there two minutes. He sees me on the tier a couple minutes later. So I'm out there all wild again. So he has to call the people over. Obviously, it's not his fault. He's he's scared himself. So anyway, so when when the people get there, I won't cough up. And um, they're like, all right, just walk to the lieutenant's office. So they're walking me to the lieutenant's office. Now, when I get to the lieutenant's office, I was even drunker than than ever, I guess, from being cold or whatever. So it was like a rookie, a rookie cop or whatever. A cop didn't know me or whatever. He sits here and it was stupid what I did. He tries to go breathalyze me. He's like, yeah, I know you weren't drinking by yourself. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's any way for me to rat or something like that. So I fucking said, what? I smacked the breathalyzer out of his hand. So it was one of them good digital ones, too. So like, it cost me a lot of money. So I smashed I, the breathalyzer bust. So when the breathalyzer bust, I guess I get to tussle around with the cops or whatever. So there was this big uh, uh, nurse lady or whatever. She was huge. She hit me with like a James Harrison tackle or something like that. I don't remember too much after that. Right? <laughs> the dudes didn't do nothing. She fair. So I was so drunk. I wake up the next day in the sh- in the shoe on lockup. I don't remember what happened. Just bits and pieces. You know how like you get blackout drunk and like bits and pieces. Like I don't know if you've ever been that fucked up, but th- I don't recommend it. Um, so. Anyway, so here comes the SIS to my door. Now I'm like, wonder where my shot's at. So I said, like, yeah, well, where's my shot? SIS says, nah, you fucked up now. He's like, you assaulted my officers. That's out at the FBI. So I'm like, whoa. So I still don't know what happened. I don't know how, how I assaulted officers or nothing like that. I don't know about punch one. I don't know nothing, man. Nobody's telling me nothing. So <laughs> eventually I get a cell buddy that came off the compound or whatever. And he told me, you know, what, what he heard on the compound. And I said, okay, so it isn't, isn't that bad, you know? So the FBI, they kicked the shot back. Like they don't prosecute me. So when they kick the shot back, you know, they come and they, you know, give you your, your ticket or whatever. So I read through it. Okay. So I go, I go before the DHO and the DHO, he opens them. He, he was like, one of, one like how we're on over, um, you know, over like Zoom or something, because he wasn't there. So he finds me. He's like, look, I'm going to find you the price of that breathalyzer. He opened a magazine, showed it to me. It was 400 bucks. So he fined me $400, okay? It gets worse. Look, so then he uh, took everything for like 18 months or whatever. You know how they do that across the board. Took the good time or whatever. And then the case managers and all, they raised my points up to a 24 to get me to get go to the penitentiary. So here's the bad part. Also, I get back to my cell in the shoe. My counselor comes walking by and he taps on things like, hey, Foss. I'm like, what's up? He's like, yeah, the DHO just charged you 400 for that breathalyzer, right? I was like, yeah. He's like, oh, yeah, don't worry about that. I go, okay, cool. He's like, yeah, now it's 800. I said, what? They took it upon their own to charge me 800. And then look, here's how bad it is. It, you can't even buy stamps or soap or nothing. It's not like being on commissary restriction. They actually freeze your account. You can't put money on the phone, none of that, until you pay that $800. That's how they do that. So I get sent, I'm getting sent to the penitentiary. Now, you hear all these stories and these tough guys and all, like, there was these guys, like, and he was in a cell over top of me. As I was in the shoe, they were, like, in the little wannabe white gang or whatever, and they beat somebody out with a lock. And I heard them telling him he's going to the penitentiary. Dude, this dude was screaming and crying. Please, I can't go. Please, I can't go. I'm like, Jesus Christ, I'm hearing this through the vent. So they designated me, they des- they designated me to Big Sandy. So that I um we leave, um, we leave what you call, we leave uh Gilmer. I gotta I'm gonna get stop you. I'm gonna stop you. You find out you're designated to Big Sandy, right? What year is this? 
this was like 2009. It does yeah. need to be Sandy. What are you thinking in your mind at, in that moment? You're leaving an FCI going to probably the most dangerous federal prison around 2008, 2009. Big Sandy was probably the most dangerous, a little worse than Atwater, a little worse than Victorville, all of them places at the time. What's going through your mind when you're like, damn, I'm going here, man. Well, yeah, I'm just like, you know, cause they called it bloody Sandy or something. That's what they called it. Right. And actually I'm going to tell you, you tried to, you tried to say something was the, the SIS when they, I got designated, he, he hated me so much. He's like, yeah, that's why you're going to bloody Sandy. I'm like, Jesus Christ, man, what the hell? You know what I mean? I was like, look, so no, the first thing, Chad, I think is I'm like, now I've been going through jails and all since I was a kid. I was in Baltimore City Jail. You know what I mean? As a kid, stuff like that. But it wasn't really hitting me. The culture shock didn't hit me until I got there. Let me let me put it that way. And you know what I'm talking about. Like, there's not like a lot of guys like us. You know what I mean? Like, i never seen some things before. So look. So I'm like, okay, you know, thinking about the, you know, whatever, I'm going to a pen. I know I screwed up. I don't got a lot of time left on my sentence. Christ, I had already had like almost six years in on 12, you know what I mean? Or I, I probably had six years in on 12. So anyway, so we get on, we get on, the, um, you know, they transfer us out of Gilmer. I got it. I had the black box on me because I had assault on police. So when I go to Oklahoma, it was actually helpful because I didn't have to wait on that stupid line and all that, you know, I, you guys got to sit there all night and stuff. They walk I'm black, right I'm black, dude, I'm black boxed everywhere I go. Even when I went to, to the low, to the FM, to the medical center, I was black boxed and I was pissed, man. I know what it's, I know you get, you know, you know, you get to the front of the line, but that black box hurts, man. Bro. And they, they, they took me on, on a flight that day. They, we left, we left whatever airport down by West Virginia and flew all the way to Chicago, somewhere, Illinois. They like kind of went to a few places instead of just going like right to Oklahoma. And my my wrists were swelled all the way the fuck up. It was, it was terrible. Like sit on that plane like that. But yeah, so I get out of there and um, from Oklahoma or whatever, I was only there a couple of days. I didn't have to sit there a few weeks or whatever. So I leave the I leave there. So then go to Atlanta. Then we wind up. Now we're going to Big Sandy from Atlanta. So. It's probably like 40 some of us on the bus. I'd say 46 of us on the bus going into Big Sandy. And I would say less than 30 of us went on the compound. You know what I mean? You know, some of them were like, no, no, no go, you know. So I had these Air Max, right? So this is what kind of threw me off too, because like the way the cops were acting, I had these Air Max that I had bought off this guy in the joint or whatever. And I took them with me. And they were like gold and um gold and gray and gold or something, you know what I mean? Slick pair of Air Max. But they were like this, like the cops, one of my property went to and said, you see this? This is the Latin King shoe and you're going to get this time. I'm like, what the fuck? It's a pair of Air Max, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Now, at this point, I had never in my life, at this point, had ever seen a white gang or a, a, a actual white gang member. No DMI, no none of that kind of stuff. I heard a DMI when I was in the FCI because they snatched me up because something was going on in Maryland, Baltimore, Maryland, and they thought I was part of DMI. I didn't even know what DMI was, and that's a fact. You know what I mean? And especially white gangs, like Aryan gangs and all that stuff. So get there, show up in Big Sandy. Now, it was locked down because I think the Muslims and the Crips uh, got into it or something like that and uh, in front of the chow hall. Now, here was the thing. Like, so I, I'm in a cell. I was actually in a single cell for a little bit of the lockdown. What they did was that was on C, on, on C side or whatever, because they wound up splitting the yard because so much violence was happening there. So they wound up splitting and splitting the yard. And like, um, C, when you would get there, C side, like C2, I think it was, was like kind of like receiving. And then like, if you go to B side, that's if you work in facilities, Unicorn, A side is the, um, is the p kitchen workers, stuff like that. There was a lot of gang members. Uh, it was gang member heavy on A side. So I first get there. So our, we're locked down for the Crips and Muslims thing, right? But the first thing I noticed was like overnight, I'm sitting there and I hear all this sh 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 like sharpening, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's people sharpening all these damn knives and shit on the floor, right? So I, I'm... It's like a culture shock. A little bit. I'm like, okay, so let me see. So now we come out. Now, dude, the first day out and first day going in the yard, talk about a culture shock. It looked like the Discovery Channel. It looks just like the damn Discovery Channel. So you look in this corner, you got all these white dudes with all this 
painted faces and Nazi signs and all this crazy shit that I don't see. I don't know nothing about this shit. You know what I mean? Then you got you got the you know the Serenios where they're they're posted up, then this one's posted up. Then you got some of the, the old black guys that think they're they're in some the warriors or something. I don't know. You know what I mean? It's such like, like a movie. So as I'm walking around, I'm like, I just look look up to God. I'm like, man, you just definitely put me in the best situations, don't you? You know what I mean? So I'm like, I'm walking walking around the yard. First person knows me, sees something to me, this dude Ray I know. Of course he's a black dude. What's up, E? I'm like, oh, what's up, man? So we spend a lap, and he just tells me about the place. And all. I said, yeah, well, you know, I'm not on no race shit. And all that. You know what I mean? So basically what that place was, it was in transition. Because I'll tell you, I got there around the time you left, because that's how I heard of you. You know what I mean? Like, when I first seen you on this show, I knew exactly who you were. Because, um, okay, I got there. And I guess at that time or whatever, them dude, the dude who got killed by the police, remember the police shot him out of the tower or the guy Ace or whatever. From, yeah, he's from, yeah. Dayton, Ohio, right? He's from Ohio. So anyway, I heard like when I got there, they had tried to jump you <laughs> or something like that. And you didn't tell me this story. Like I heard this story from somebody who was there who knows the story and all. And they said that you got out on them. Like you, like you fucked them up. You know what I mean? So that was like a big talk, you know what I mean? Like people would say that, you know what I mean? Like, you know, people were just like talking, you know, and I was just like, damn, you know what I mean? So like, that's how I heard of you, you know? So you might've still been in the shoe or you might've already been transferred or whatever. So basically like this whole place was in transition. So nobody had control of the place. So you're bringing in Boston guys from everywhere. Cause you know, Boston is pretty deep in the feds, like for white guys. So you had, um, you had SAC, you had ABTs, um, what other ABT sack? Oh, the Aryan Circle. You know what I mean? You had them. I mean, it was just like so. Everybody's kind of like vying for a little bit of power. Then you got like the skinhead dudes. Like you see these kids come in from the East Coast. They're coming in with like five years, and they wind up shaving their head and getting some stupid tattoo on their head when they're not even like that. You know what I mean? They let these guys manipulate them into how how they want to live or whatever. But like so. There was a few incidents there because all that power struggle stuff uh, basically was um, like there was the incident with, um, OK, Boston Billy. Uh, did you hear him? Yeah, I helped yeah. Boston Billy get out of prison. I did his I did his compassionate release. He, he got out about six, seven months ago. OK, OK. Look, so I was there for his incident with the guy Blue. Remember the guy Blue from SAC or whatever? When he was OK, so look, what happened was. OK, Boston Billy, Boston Billy actually kind of caused it. Well, he did cause that. So he was coming. Like I told you how they had the, the yard split. So we all wouldn't go to chow together. So you know how the tables are like, I guess this table for them is the sack table. But like when we're eating on C side or on B side, it was the Boston table or the independent table, whatever you want to call it. Right. So Boston Billy had a dentist appointment or something. So he's coming through there while they're at lunch. OK. So he sees all the sack guys sitting at the table. He said, I'll tell you motherfuckers what. He, he said, I'll tell you what. This ain't no damn sack table. I'll, when I come over there and all this, so he starts talking a bunch of, you know what I mean? So they go back and forth, back and forth. So basically what happens is the next day, the next day, um, or like day or two later, he's in the chow hall. Now, when he's in the chow hall, um, when he's in the chow hall, they come up and Blue worked in the chow hall. They wind, he winds up coming up behind Billy or whatever, and he, you know, he hit him, you know what I mean, with the joint. So he's hitting him or whatever, but now the dude Billy fought, you know what I mean? Boss Billy was fighting. So Boss Billy's come, boom, 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 you know, so they're rumbling or whatever. They fall down all in the spaghetti or whatever, but like, so he hit him up. So now the fat kid Frankie and them from Boston. Uh, you, Frank you know, Fugone, one of the people that jumped me. Yeah, yeah. So they... They were on Seaside, so this happened to Billy. So later on, I guess that night, not because the jail didn't get locked down or nothing. So I guess that night, they wind up. There was this guy who hung around with Sack. It was just in the unit. He ain't even a part of Sack or nothing, but he was in their unit. They run down on him with locks and socks, and they bust his ass. So now they go to the shoe. Now this guy isn't in the gang or nothing like that. So I don't know if SIS didn't figure out to lock everybody down or whatever, but no, the jail didn't get locked down. 
So now the next day, the next day, this guy Lon, he's from um, he's from Detroit, he's from the city, but he was a skinhead and he was actually a thorough dude. Like he could actually use one of the rare ones who could actually fight, you know what I mean? So he he actually goes and they go to hit the old head guy, Boston Bobby. I don't know if you know him. Uh, he had been there for a while, I think. So good thing for him, he could fight a little bit too, because they say like when, when Lonnie went and hit him, like that was like, you know, they're fighting, they're bobbing, weaving. It was like, you know, he just, but Lonnie had that knife. So he he busted his ass. He he fucked him up pretty good. So right around that right, time. Who got, messed up, who got messed up in, in that incident? You said he got. Uh, Boston Bobby, because Lonnie had the knife. You know what I mean? Lonnie had the knife, but I mean, Boston, Boston Bobby. Are you, the talking about, are you talking about Boston Bobby with the long hair? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, he had longer hair. He used to, he he was older guy. He was older. Long guy. time. Yeah, he, I know you're he, talking about. But go ahead. Yeah. yeah, so he wound up getting stabbed up or whatever. But like to his, to you know, to to him though, I'll say this: he he can fight. Like he could fight. He he fought it off. Whereas if he wouldn't have been able to fight as much as he could, he would have been gone. You know what I mean? Because he, you know, he and he had a tough guy on his ass. Like, so around that time, that was around. Um, so it's just a bunch of like different. It was chaos. There was really no organization. So that's around the time of the Super Bowl when they got the guy Mac. Um, he he ran. He was actually like from Kentucky or whatever. Now, here's the story on him. He started running with the, the ABTs or whatever, but I don't think that he really was like that. And here's why I say, because I had heard something like he grew up in like, you know, a regular neighborhood, like a neighborhood where black people, are, you know, like neighborhoods, like normal neighborhoods. Right. But in like a country place like in Kentucky or something, you know what I mean? So like he, he would like he could play sports. He would hoop, you know what I mean? And he could throw his hands pretty good. Right. So he could throw his hands pretty good. So he's running with them. So they're getting, you know, they always want to get drunk or whatever. And then that guy, you know, Swift or whatever. He, um, so I guess he got into it with Swift earlier on in the week and he put hands on Swift, you know, and then he got into it with another one and he put hands on them, you know, as they're drunk fighting or whatever, you know, you know, it's just like you know, things that happen, you know. So I guess they plotted on him, waited for the Super Bowl. It was uh, Green Bay, Pittsburgh Super Bowl. And they wound up, they wound up getting him in the cell. And I mean, they crushed him, but they were they like stomped on his head, did all kind of crazy stuff. To this day, I don't know exactly what happened because I was there. And I'll I tell you, what, I'll tell you what happened. That dude is in a vegetative state. He never made it out. Um right, right. but Swift turned his life around. I heard he was a Christian. It's crazy to think that Swift would be a Christian, but I heard that he's a full-fledged Christian, turned his life around and living his best life, I guess. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's crazy. That's 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 nuts. Like um, another five years for paralyzing dude for the rest of his life. How much did he get? I think they got like five years, fifty-seven months or something like that for paralyzing the dude for the rest of his life. Okay, so that's okay. So listen, because now now you clarified that because that is one of the things that I heard. I heard he died. Then I heard he was paralyzed. Then I heard something. I you know what I mean. But so he is. That's a shame. That that's a total shame. But um. Yeah, so Big Sandy was Big Sandy was pretty much like that, like um, you know. But it was like it was like chaos. Like people don't understand. Like I hear people say, like, oh, state prison and the feds, state prisons this and the feds is sweet. I was like, no, 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 no. And actually, nowadays, state prison on probably on all levels is better than a federal prison. They don't even feed you anymore in federal prison. You know what I mean? Absolutely horrible. So let me ask you this: you know, some of the stuff that you've been around, the things that you've seen. He said, no, I've never been around no white gang members. I've never been in this environment before. And now that you see people getting stabbed, you see people getting jumped on, does it affect you mentally, emotionally at all? Yeah. Yeah. Prison's going to affect people in, in, in totally different ways. Like, I'm not the type to be, uh, you know what I mean? I'm not the type to be like, uh, what do you call it, institutionalized. Like, when I get out of prison and stuff, I can hit the ground running and stuff. I can get along in society. I know how to speak to people. You know, I know how to do real business, stuff like that. But I do. It screwed me up. Whereas though, I'll go into phases where I value my privacy really, really hard. You know what I mean? Like I don't want people around me certain time. You know what I mean? It's just like you, you, you understand what I'm saying because of 
a, a lack of privacy. And also, like, with the things that you see and the cutthroat stuff that you see over petty stuff, it's like you always got your guard up, which is a good thing, you know, but, like, it's like it can – look, the things you see, you talk about PTSD, man, like, dude, nah, like, like prison, you got to see that uh, – you know, I mean, that the federal prison and just the weird stuff that goes on and the manipulation and just like the things that people do. And people really are dying. Like people are really dying. Like, do you remember? Uh, do you, were you there when Bruce was there? Bruce Young? I know Bruce got killed in Pollock, man. Yeah, I interviewed yeah. the dude that was in. I think the dude was he wasn't from Baltimore. He was there when all that stuff happened. I actually interviewed the warden that was there, the associate warden also. Um, yeah. You know, I, I liked Bruce, man. And. He was yeah. he was a little bit touched at times because of being in prison and Hollywood was his brother. I, I mean, Hollywood man, Ooh. Nixon, good dude, man. Look, look, Hollywood, Hollywood is the one who told me about you. <laughs> Hollywood, 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 yeah, Hollywood. I was there when Hollywood got sick. He got sick, and I don't know what's going on with him now. Um, I tried to help him. I wrote him in numerous letters. He was writing me back. I'm like, dude, I'll just do your compassionate release for free. Send me, you know, your 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 certificates, all of that, and then he just quit writing me, dude. He says. I think mentally he's destroyed. His sister died recently. She had a, oh. she had a seven year old son. His brother gets killed in prison. I think he's just mentally distraught, bro. Hey, Bruce. Bruce was wild. <laughs> Bruce was wild. Bruce did. Hey, he went hard, man. Like like I liked Bruce. He was there. Um, when I was there with him, he beat the hell out of this sack dude, man. Like Bruce would just do some crazy stuff, you know. He beat the hell out of this sack dude because he, you know, Bruce was so anti gang member and everything like that and. He was just wild, man. And, and and the crazy part is, like, if you looked at him, he looks like a nerd. You know what I mean? Looks like a stone cold nerd. But yeah, so he was he was there. Like that's that's people I kicked it with. Really was would be like like the Bruce, the Hollywoods, people like that. Um, you know, I, like like when you go in there, another thing is like, I see too many like East Coast white dudes. Like they they just like tuck their tail like and just become something that they're not. You know what I mean? So it's like. It's like, you know, they'll sit here, they'll sit here and, and tuck their tail and shave their head and do all this and do all that. And I'm like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? What are you doing? It's like they ruin their life. Like um, I told a story about this kid, Kenny. This is when, when I first got the big Sandy. Check out what happened to him. So he's from Detroit, right? I don't know if he's from the city, but he's definitely from around Detroit or whatever. He was like normal, like watch sports and stuff. I met him in front of sports TV, you know, talking shit. You know what I mean? You know, you know, you know what time it is. You know the Ravens. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so anyway, now he um, so I had that single cell. So I was like, look, you're not in a gang or nothing like that. He's like, nah. So he's a few years under me. He's probably 27, but he was bald. So I was like, yeah, you could move in with me. So he's like, okay, cool. So here's the manipulation. Here's why it, what happens to is sick. So I come in the cell. I, I left the yard or whatever. I come in the cell. He's sitting there on the, on the bunk looking at some pamphlet, all goofy and stuff. So I'm like, what the hell? What are you doing? He's like, E, I think you need to read about your people. I said, bro, I said, I think I know who my people are. My people are the people I go make that phone call and I tell them, send me some money or tell them to take care of something. That's my people. <laughs> I said, I said, and I don't recommend you getting involved in none of that kind of stuff. I said, but I can't tell you what to do. So two days later, here he comes down to the cell. Guess what he's got? He's got a tattoo of Odin's eye, a bunch of the uh, Swazi signs all over his head. And he's sad. He's like me. He's bald. He can't grow hair. So look. So he's like, E, do you like my tat? I said, hell no. You know what I mean? He's like, he's like, what do you mean? I was like, man, I said, I think you're an idiot, right? So long story short, he winds up going to A-side with all the gang members working in the kitchen. So I wound up going to B-Side, which was like um, the Unicor facilities, stuff like that. So he sits here. I, I'm in the chow hall eating. He comes up to my table. He's like, hey, what's up, E, man? I'm like, oh, what's up, Kenny? So he's like, he sits down for a second. And he's like, man, I should have really listened to you. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, you know, when you were telling me about, it, you know, not messing. I said, yeah. I said, well, it looks a little too late for that. He's like, yeah, it is, man. And I don't hear nothing else. But now here's the story of what happened. So. Somebody was getting there that the ACs didn't like. So you know how you get the laundry list? The laundry guy gets the list of whoever's coming in or whatever. So you know ahead of time who's getting there. So if a person's going to get hit and people are there to hit them, they can set it up. You know what I mean? So basically, they send Kenny on his first mission. They tell Kenny, whoever this guy is, whoever he was, that they didn't like. 
they give Kenny a big bone crusher. And your audience probably knows by now what a bone crusher is. You know, this isn't no, this isn't no little play toy. So they give Kenny a bone crusher and send Kenny around to, you know, get the dude or whatever to Kenny's guy hit him. So you know how the corridors are? You know how they are in Big Sandy? Like you walk around all the corridors and stuff. So Kenny was walking through the corridors and I guess cuts off. This is what he does. He ruined his whole life, basically. He cuts off to the lieutenant's office, walks right up to the desk, puts the knife on the desk and spills the beans. Says, oh, the ACs want me to hit this guy, this and that, this and that. So right then and there, now he's on PC. They're definitely the rest of his fed bit. Now he had detainers too, Chad, to go to Detroit with all the Nazi signs and stuff on his head. That's why kids got to pay attention to things. Like you cannot just sign up for anything that you're not prepared to do. You know, he made he made a horrible mistake. Like, and that's the manipulation these gang dudes will do on people. You know what I mean? I've seen them do it to, to the younger guys all the time. And a lot of the times, like the younger guys don't understand this either. A lot of them dudes who've been sitting in them penitentiaries 20 and 30 years sitting there on that wall. They're trying to go home. They're trying to go home. I don't care what they stood up on before, all that kind of stuff. If they see somebody from Mudlick, Indiana, they're, they're from New York City or something. They see somebody from Mudlick, Indiana, commit something horrendous, and they could go home. You know that gas and that bus up. You know what I mean? Not fish fried. Like that. That's it. You're, you're fish fried. That's it. It's over with. They don't care about you. Yeah. It's just crazy. Like, um, but like that whole place, that whole place, big scene, there was cool points to it too. Like I, like the, the one thing about it was, no, I don't mean like that. I mean, with the police, with the, with the COs, they respected you more. Like they respected you more there. Like I remember one time, um, I was, I was supposed to be at facilities cause that was my assigned job. I still don't know where facilities is. I never went. So it was a rookie CO working. Right. So now I told you, I only have a few years left, but I just tried this motherfucker and it worked. He comes by, he calls the 12 o'clock census count to see where everybody's at. So he walks up to my cell. He's like, what's your name? I said, Eric Foss. He's like, why aren't you at work? I broke my mug down. I said, cause I'm in fucking prison. That's why I ain't at work. He's just like, okay. He just, he just went along his way. You know what I mean? But like, you know, that something like that in FCI, they would probably jump you and three in the shoe, everything. But it's just. It was just like a totally, it's just like a totally different experience. Like, um, people don't understand, like, it's just like the weird stuff. I, it's, it's like in the 1800s or something, like the pettiness and the weirdness of it. Like, don't you feel the same way? The easiest way, I think, to explain it is, look, man, it's a machine, bro. It takes the toughest dudes, the weakest dudes. It'll chew you up and spit you out. You can be the toughest man on the, on the planet, but you end up there and they got 10 people on you with knives. You're no longer the toughest man. Anything can happen. It's a world of manipulation. It's a world of deceit. Not everybody's a scumbag in prison. There's a lot of good dudes in there, but it's just that, you know, it's just the, it's just that atmosphere, man, where everybody's out to, Hey man, I got to make it through today. And no matter what it takes, whether I got to go down here and pretend to get a Nazi tattoo on my head, like that dude, or if I got to say, Hey man, I'm from New York and I'm white, but I'm riding with the New York car. Or if I'm like, Hey man, I'm going to stab this dude. Cause if not, they're going to stab me, but I ain't going to really stab them, stab them. They're sending me on a mission. I'm just going to poke him a couple times. I know I'll be all right. They're going to be that thing where you're going to think you're going to poke him just a little bit and he dies. And now you got a life sentence when you only had 10 years. This is the reality of federal prison, right? Right. Right. It's that's, it, that's the truth. I seen, um, I also seen, uh, uh, it was around the time I was going through big Sandy and everything. You probably heard of this incident when, um, it was in Atlanta holdover. It was one of them gang dudes. He's a younger dude. He had like a tattoo on half his face. They call him two face or something. Well, he was in a cell in Atlanta with a chomo and everybody pumped him up. It was like, you got to do something. Well, he, he off the chomo. He took the chomo's life or whatever. Every one of them dudes who pumped him up, the orderlies, all that kind of stuff. When it was time to go, they all went and testified against him. You know what I mean? The reality. So look, Eric, how long you been out, man? I've been out. I'm, I actually, I actually went back. I actually got out in 2014, but I went back in 2000. 18 for three and a half years over um i wasn't even under investigation what happened was my i was going down to mma fights and my buddy called me up he was under investigation he was like uh what are you doing tonight i was like i'm going down to fights he's like oh i might stop down I'm like all right if you do make sure you bring your girl because i was with my girl they said they, they actually indicted me for that they said girl meant coke like they came raided raided us everything like that didn't find nothing and then i could i wound up i I wound up pleading guilty to like under uh, like 400 grams of powder or whatever. So 
people were like, well, why did you plead guilty? I was like, because first off, I'm going to sit there three years waiting to go to waiting to go to trial. Second off, I'm going to lose trial. Third off, I, it's a, even though they didn't find nothing, I know how the federal system works. If I sit that, if I sit there, and I also I'm locked up, they didn't release me or anything, so I'm sitting there doing time anyway. So I know how the federal system works. If I sit there and wait to go to trial, they might have some dudes who come in and talk about different drug amounts and pump up my drug levels. You know what I mean? You never know. So if it's sitting there on the table, 400 grams or whatever, you know what I mean? Like something, something like that. Look, you look at that as like, you know, like you got to got away with something, which you didn't, you know what I mean? But so I got out on that. I got out on that in um, New Year's Eve of uh, 22. 22. What are you doing now, man? You out of the game, bro? Is it over with, man? Is the girl and the powder and all, is it all over with now, man? Yeah, yeah, that's, listen, dude, that's been over with. Look, the only thing I have is, like, look, that's all been over with, but, like, I've only had one incident. I only had one incident. That was last year in August. Well, it's actually July or whatever. Well, I had an incident where I actually went to jail, but I beat the case. It was some, it was some crap. Somebody I was helping stole money from me, stole a bunch a decent amount of money because I do like I do like a remodel and stuff like that. I'm still involved a little bit in real estate and stuff. So a lot of my times with my workers and stuff, I'll pay them I'll pay them fully up front, you know, while I'm waiting to get paid a third, a third, a third. So what happened was I had a bunch of I had a bunch of money on me. Now that's gotta go to my workers, some of them go to the bank. I sit it down inside somebody's house that I'm helping for 10 minutes. They roll out with the money, go put it in storage, and I'm like what the hell? You know what I mean? So I tell him, look, I know you took my money. And just give the money back. Just give the money back. Anyway, they're tr not trying to give the money back. I wind up bumping into them at a hotel. So I bump into them at a hotel. I see them with like a tanning bag, right? And I see it all lumpy and stuff. So obviously that's my money in there. So I snatched, I snatched the bag. I'm just trying to get up out of there. So they tear my shirt off and everything. So I'm just leaving. I'm not trying to fight nobody or nothing. I'm trying to get away with whatever money I got left, you know? So turn around, the girl that I'm with, I guess she jumps into it. She could have just left, but she jumps into it. That's trying to help me or whatever. I turn around, they're kicking her ass. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I got to run back. I got to run back and, and, and get into it with them. So I get into it with them a little bit. She's all right. She gets up. So we get up out of there. So you would figure when I get the money back, there's like, there's a decent amount missing. You would figure they would just be cool with that. No, they actually press robbery charges on me. And they said, right, and this is how crazy it is. They said, right, the police report, like, this is how dumb the cops were. Like, they told the cop that I robbed them for $50,000 at a hotel, cash. And I'm like, first and foremost, the cop don't even ask them where they got $50,000 from. They actually did, did, it's just like in a police report. So they locked me up for robbery, and I, 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 they want to give me a bail, because you know how the bail system is now. You can't even pay a bail anymore. They're just letting out certain people. They, they're not letting me out. So... Anyway, so I had to sit there like I got a good lawyer and everything. So I, I had to sit there like four months. He got me a quick court date, thank God. And I beat the case because it was so stupid. But, yeah, I, I stay out of all that stuff now. You know what I mean? I started doing a YouTube channel and stuff. So I'm just, you know, messing around with doing whatever, you know. You, know, you, uh, you put a TikTok video up the other day and it, it blew up. We'll, yeah. uh, we'll, we'll post your TikTok. I'll post your YouTube channel, all of that. You know, hey, look, man, you've been through it. You lived it, man. You lived the stuff that people talk about. You know, a lot of people talk about prison. They might yeah. only been a year or two. And, you know, they talk about them stories and this and that, and they didn't really live it. You really lived it, bro. Yeah. You know, I definitely I appreciate you coming on, man, sharing your story. Anything you want to say before we go? Plug your YouTube channel. Tell them where to find you on TikTok, all of that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Stay, standing on business with Eric Foss. That's my YouTube channel. All you got to do is punch in the YouTube, Eric Foss, my name, and it'll pop up. And, um, yeah, my TikTok's eboss853. E yeah, I definitely, hey, Chad, I definitely went viral. 1.3 million off of, but nobody a hey, nobody pays attention to like to nothing because i'll tell you what it was oj simpson passed away i'm out i'm t smoking a cigarette outside and i'm like i'll do a real quick funny tiktok on oj simpson so i was talking i said yes um it's true oj did confess and then i you know a deathbed confession and then I, at the end i said Yes, he confessed to um, accepting money in when he was in college. You know what I mean? I didn't mention nothing about the, the case, the, 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 the dolphin, nothing. Dude, it got so many views, and a bunch of people were arguing. There's people in their own comments. They're arguing for me, acting like I really got a deathbed confession from OJ.
<laughs> oh, good, man. Listen, man, I definitely appreciate you, man, coming on. Tell people if you like what we're doing, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Check this brother out in the links, Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Until tomorrow, with respect, we're out. Thank you.